when civilians are threatened, when diplomats are in danger, when disaster strikes, the RTF is ready for action. They're an elite special ops group and an emergency service rolled into one. The task force exists to practice medicine, you see, whether it's a prescription of hot lead or high power antibiotics. Philosophers, thinkers, and Hakim, if you're in trouble and you need saving, then there's nobody you'd want to see more than the red and orange of Rama. The founding and commanding officer of the RTF is General Fadwa Khatef. She is a no-nonsense woman with a preference for the high tech. She has always been a strong proponent of tags and remote presence units, having pioneered their use in Hak Islam during the neo-colonial wars. They represent the science and super soldiers of Hak Islam, hearkening back to the storied practice of Muslim medicine. In Islamic tradition, Muhammad calls medicine the salvation of the body, and theology is the salvation of the soul. The practice of healing was a part of faith. It was not separate. It was as important as theology for a practitioner of Islam. In those early days, the practice of it was pious as well. It was an act of both faith and trust. You see, Muhammad had strong opinions on health issues. He believed that every disease had a cause and a cure. Muslims were already engaged in medical research by the time of the early Arab conquests. Syria, Egypt, Iran, these civilizations had rich philosophical and scientific traditions that were integrated into the Arabian Empire. Their knowledge was translated, preserved, and shared, peaking in 830 with, with the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. Persian traditions influenced pre-existing Arab thinking on the body as sacred, fueling anatomical research. Egyptian and Syrian herbalism became an important tool to new Arab doctors. It wasn't just medicine, of course. Muslim scholars made numerous important scientific and technological advances in mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, metallurgy, architecture, textiles, and agriculture. Many of their techniques are actually still in use today. Ibn Sina was the final authority on medical matters in Europe for several centuries. Although Ibn Sina made advances in pharmacology and in clinical practice, his greatest contribution was probably in the philosophy of medicine. He created a system of medicine that today we would call holistic, and in which physical and psychological factors, drugs, and diet were all combined when treating patients. The Arabian empires eventually declined, first the Mongols, then the Ottoman Turks and the Europeans in Spain. But many of those Islamic traditions remain alive and well in modern medical practice. A similar golden age began with the colonization of Borak. New technologies were being invented daily. Hospitals covered the continents to assist with settlers who were not entirely prepared for the rigors of a terraforming world. Many doctors were as popular as any soldier or celebrity. Qasim Azmi and Khalaf al Ataba were as famous as any Maya star for their advances in the curation of organic tissue. Of course, that's nothing compared to Qayyam Zaman, who invented the method to synthesize silk. Silk is not a miracle drug, it's silk, TM, a gene courier and product of Borak, TM. And to give us an understanding of it, before we go further, let's hear from Mr. DNA. All organisms have long molecules inside them called DNA. The pattern of different molecules within DNA is what we call genetic code, and it provides instructions for building bacteria, plants, and animals. Tiny machines inside the cells read that genetic code and use those instructions to build bacteria, plants, and animals. Now, inserting new instructions into DNA is a lot harder than programming your 3D printer. For one, you have to get at the DNA inside the cells without killing them. It's like reaching into the 3D printer while it's on and changing the instructions without breaking your resin miniatures. Also, cells don't like getting random chunks of DNA shoved in them. And so, to reprogram cells, to have them grow in a way other than normal, we gotta first get our new instructions inside the cell, second, break that existing DNA somewhere, and third, we gotta get our cell to fix its own DNA by sticking our inserted chunk inside the gap. Thanks, Mr. DNA. Nasiat is a unique plant found in the wilds of Borak. It is frequently infested by an unusual sap parasite. It interacts with a Nasiat plant to create a unique chemical change. Harvesting the Nasiat at the moment of hatching provides the organic chemistry needed to produce silk. The exact science behind it is unclear. Samples of Nasiat have been smuggled off-world in an effort to reproduce it for cheaper, but to limited success. It seems like the natural cycle of the planet, the parasite, and the Nasiat altogether are critical to the change. The patent rights to silk may have ended, but that cult of secrecy remains. The only thing that off-world scientists can say for sure 
is that it's a biogenic substance operating on chemical principles, spun off from new theories of physics thanks to the Quantronics revolution. One possibility is that silk is a superior, natural version of CRISPR, a gene editing system found in nature. You got scissor-like proteins that cut out the DNA that you want to remove, and a guiding RNA that decides where you put that DNA you want. Silk, therefore, is inert on its own. It's just a gene courier weaving its way throughout the body like silk in a dress or a tapestry. It eagerly awaits instructions for what genetic code to remove and what to insert. These instructions are generated by Quantronics-assisted tools, and with that, you can give cells all kinds of new features. You want to jump high? Get some extra muscle in your legs. Maybe you want to flush all the fat cells from your face. Tell the fat cells in your face to get to work. The sky's the limit when you're using silk, TM. When Kayyem Zaman first discovered silk, he knew that this was one of the greatest revolutions in human history, and that without careful stewardship, it would be stolen by hyper-corporations and foreign governments. That's where the silk route comes in. Trade companies transport silk directly from borac to the client. Silk is inert, just a clear liquid in a tube, I think. It needs a unique catalyzing agent to function, and it's provided with each shipment to make reverse engineering difficult. Silk 2.3 lets you replace organs locally, reverse stem cells, program immune response, generate nerves, re-sculpt faces, charge up bones, and perhaps most important, stop those allergies so you can pet cats. The most world-changing implementation was only possible thanks to continued advances in hardware. Cubes are implanted in most humans at a young age, and integrated into the body using silk. Cubes are programmed to track and record a perfect digital shadow of the brain, nervous system, and everything needed to recreate a person. This everything is called a shut, from the Egyptian shadow soul. A cube, therefore, is a backup of your shut. You can also do a brain scan as a backup, but this process is time-consuming and inconvenient. With a cube or a remote backup, you can recreate a person in totality. Anna Xanthopoulos was the first human to be resurrected. After death, her cube was implanted into a custom-grown lost, or life host. Silk is miraculous, but it does have downsides, primarily related to the incredible control it offers over the human body. For example, nitrocaine is a silk-derived drug which creates a long-term mood-tailored high that can be programmed and hacked through your cube. Silk is not the only medicine in Hak Islam, of course. Organs and tissues can be regrown with ease thanks to the work of the Medina Teaching Hospital, melanin theories for early colonists, shifting skin patterns for modest citizens, and Hanba longevity treatments for the future. It's a combination of all these medicines, combined with the growing need that led to the creation of the Rama Task Force. In Hak Islamite culture, scientists have a place of honor in society. An evil, unethical scientist is therefore a horrible villain, and mad doctors are a common trope in Hak Islamite Maya series. It's like showing someone killing an animal. Only someone truly evil would perform experiments to turn a person into a killing machine. As such, it took decades for Hak Islam super soldier programs to bear fruit. First, you have to find volunteers. This isn't that difficult, because the possibility of becoming a superhuman is very appealing. But not all candidates are created equal. Ibn Sina's holistic methodology remains paramount. Every human is the totality of their person, their mind, their body. You can't just work on the physical and ignore the mental state of a patient. As such, finding good candidates takes a lot of time. This is especially true for the laboratories on Borac, which aim for literally zero bad outcomes for test subjects. This isn't like the Spetsnaz or the Hassassians. These are all very public programs. Nobody ends up disfigured or debilitated. There's a program for convicts, but they have the same rights and the doctors have the same responsibilities. Zero bad outcomes, no deaths. There are rumors that slavers and human traffickers are used in less savory experiments, but these are just unsubstantiated conspiracy theories. Super soldier programs are overseen by the MAA, that is, the Monatamat Albacht Aldefea. This is the military research agency tasked with developing and implementing next generation tools and services for Hak Islam and its many militaries. The fearsome Makluba Shroud of the Cheetahs, or the cutting edge holomasks used by the Hafsa. The military of Hak Islam might not be that of Pan Oceania, but why would it be? Pan Oceania doesn't have the big man himself. Speaking of the big man, the very first program was known as Runihura, or Destroyer. Aliasara Labs got its start helping colonists adapt to borax, then mostly inhospitable atmosphere. Xeno disease and harsh environmental conditions took a serious toll on many first-wave settlers, 
and Ali Asara made a name for itself in the many Bimaristans across the planet. Over time, they turned their practical augmentations up to 11, with the Destroyer program in the aftermath of the Silk Revolts. Many veterans of the revolts volunteered for the chance to remain in fighting shape for another few decades. Among the many candidates chosen was a young Tarek Mansuri. The Runihura augmentations were successful across the board, resulting in a Khawarij unit, but had a unique effect on Tarek, turning him into an absolute unit of a man. It's still not clear why Tarek gained so much mass and power. Some suspect it was related to a mission early in his career, wherein he stormed an Equinox safehouse and was exposed to some kind of mystery substance. Others suspect that he was simply jacked as shit before the augmentations. Regardless, Tarek is on the posters, literally, for the Khawarij in specific and the super soldiers in general. Khawarij are more than just augmented humans, 60% of their genetic code has been rewritten. They are inured to aging, disease, pain, and poison. They are superhumanly fast and strong, and can secrete poison from their skin. And they can dunk, baby. There were a number of other programs founded in its wake. The first successor, the Nahir or Wonder program, came from Midan Biosolutions, based also out of Medina. This one was the most high-profile failure, primarily due to the selection of test subjects. Rumors abound that the test subjects became too comfortable with killing for Medan's tastes, and too controversial for the Hak Islamite government. Some suspect that those individuals were then trained as Hassassins, becoming particularly cold-blooded ambush troops. In the wake of its failure, many suspected that the age of super soldiers was over already, but the money started to pour in. Patents and medicines developed as a part of the Runihura began to trickle into the civilian market, finally turning a profit on the now-famous red turbans of the Khawarij. Medan Biosolutions' second program was known as the Nayabi, meaning rarity or curio. This time, they selected former soldiers exclusively, especially focusing on airborne troops. Whether foreign or domestic, there was something about the psyche of a person who jumps out of a dropship, or even from orbit, that made the Nayabi program particularly useful. The resulting Nahab Aeromobile unit have a reputation for being good at their jobs, but also arrogance. Maybe it's the augmentation, maybe it's the swagger that comes with an elite military unit. Maybe it's the fact that they all wear these damn tiaras, but something in the Nahab psyche makes them crave action, risks, and close combat. Their skin tingles when they approach a drop zone, their blood runs hot at the chance to use their blades or even bare hands on an opponent. Like I said, these programs are all overseen by the aforementioned Monatamat Albert Aldafea. Like any military research agency, they have their fair share of controversies. The most notable was the Saika program. Akram Bioscience is the absolute largest corporation in Hak Islam, and the leading pharmaceutical giant in the human sphere. They have a rigid, spotless, organized aesthetic that gives Akram a sense of smug superiority. Human progress is only served by science and carefully documented, well-tested works. Akram tried its hand with the Saika or Lightning Initiative. The goal was maximum speed and resistance. Operators trained to breach hard targets, then deploy implanted nanoweapons to deal with enclosed spaces. However, Ali Asara Labs, struggling at the time, sued Akram, claiming that Akram had used stolen and protected techniques developed for the Runahura augmentations. There were numerous lawsuits and heads ended up rolling. Even a number of high-level defense officials of the MAA ended up quitting in disgrace. Many think Ali Asara was given a second contract as an apology, even though it has not yet borne fruit. There's no doubt that they need test subjects, though, and Ali Asara is always on the lookout for good candidates. Akram's super soldier programs are spearheaded by Dr. Shala Armajani, and the goal was not to create a weapon, but to enhance existing skills. For the hyperactive and hyper-aware, the Saika initiative bore fruit in the form of the Mukhtar. The Mukhtar Active Response Unit is trained for rapid insertions and short to mid-range engagements. They can turn on a dime and run as fast as a soldier in powered combat armor. Most of them have short-range nanoweapons implanted, because switching to your pistol is not as fast as pointing your wrist at someone. Their follow-up was the Sunur, or Feline Project. This was a purely defensive project. The goal was to help their super soldiers live as long as possible by keeping them as healthful as possible. This meant focusing on stealth, agility, and reactive biochemistry in addition to just speed. Early test subjects exhibited cat-like eyes as a result of their vision augmentations, an inhuman ability to dodge from artificial muscles, and possibly gustatory pickiness that prefers wet food to dry. The felines were being developed exclusively in the human edge system, where they could be deployed far from prying eyes. Unfortunately, 
That secrecy nearly spelled the end of the Sunar program. Being so distant from civilized space meant that rivals felt comfortable in attacking them, first indirectly and then directly through Ikari Company. It started with a horse, as it always does. The CS Aigir, a massive ship owned by Akram, was targeted by the Kamatachi Maru. It was boarded and then sacked, then destroyed with the crew on board. That's right. That's f***ing right. Just like the Ikari Company video, it's all connected. From there, Ikari raided hard and soft targets, grabbing what they could and smashing what they couldn't. Pharmacorp gleefully consumed Akram's market share, at least until intel gathered by Hakislam operations proved Pharmacorp's involvement. This kicked off the Apothecary Conflict, a guns-out fight between Pharmacorp and Akram. An elite force produced by the Sooner Super Soldier program took center stage. This was the Namur Experimental Operating Group, called such because they were simply not ready for prime time. Their antipathy-inspired immunities were incomplete, their longevity treatment was unfinished. That didn't stop them from becoming absolute legends. They succeeded in missions where larger, more intimidating teams would be outgunned and outmanned. Normally, Pharmacorp announces every single discovery with a Maya cast, fanfare, day-long celebration on their prime research campus on Varuna. But the end of the Apothecary conflict left Pharmacorp to instead quietly answer for crimes to O12 High Commissioners. The Apothecary conflict brought in other elements of the Rama Task Force. To a degree, the hostilities continue. Every year, Pharmacorp and Akram trade quiet, violent blows each trying to oust the other and claim control of the inner colony's markets. One example of this was Operation Red Veil. This was al Hijib al-Ahmar, a special deployment to expose a scandal of involving Tetian PSN. Tetian had been cooking the books for Pharmacorp, improving their stock prices amidst the ongoing apothecary conflict. Unfortunately, the Anjing, that being the Yujing Party Intelligence Agency, was carrying out a black operation at the same time, using Tetian to acquire strategic, in-depth detail about Pan Oceania's own super soldier programs. So, the Rama Task Force has existed for several decades, during which time it has become the face of the Al Medinat Caliphate. Although all four of the main states on Borak have their own militaries, RTF is the premier force in Medina. It is led by General Fadwa Khatef, its founder and thus far only commanding officer. They fought throughout the neo-colonial wars, but their largest deployments were during the Third Offensive. The combined army's renewed assault was a bursting dam over a flooded valley. The RTF was engaged in a huge number of frontline battles, splitting its time between the front and evacuating civilians. al Hadiye quickly became the last line of defense in central Nostralia. al Hadiye is Haq Islam's capital on the continent, and ever since Ukbar fell, it became alarmingly close to combat. Forces in the new bastion city of Zaima have, for now, kept North Australia safe, and High Command intends to keep the combined army pinned in and around Zaima. Zaima is a pressure cooker. Booby traps, attacks on civilians, stations, and mosques run rampant. But it's better to bog down the enemy in urban combat than to let them reach the main Rama garrison at Al-Hadiye. Al-Hadiye is critical for several reasons. First, it is the most valuable cities with a specialization in botany and botanical research. Neither side wishes to destroy the elevator. The cables would wreak unpredictable havoc across the front lines, and the combined army clearly intends to capture and utilize it in a breakthrough of the planet. Well, we'll have to see what happens. No matter what, Haq Islam won't let the city go without a fight. Direct conflict with the combined army is hardly the only time that the Rama task force has been mobilized. In fact, one of their first missions is still ongoing. Medina is a cosmopolitan city on a hill, a wondrous place that gives San Pietro or Tunguska a run for their money. But it has its own dark side. This is the Siasokak, the Black Alley. Only Bakunin can rival the Siasokak in the realm of mad science. Illicit psychosurgery, unethical genetic projects, and classic organ trading all make their home in this virtual space. Siasokak surgeons are reviled on Maya, especially in Hak Islamic culture, but they are valued with money in the rest of the sphere. They are scattered across Borak physically, but they gather in the darkest corners of Maya and fly to Medina to perform surgeries in the shadow of the Great Mosque. The Rama Task Force and Hassassins both consider this the Aswa Kabus, the worst nightmare, for this is a perversion of what they hold dear. Spirituality and science, both corrupted for evil ends, temporal greed and an unwholesome lust for power, eclipsing the good judgment given to us by God. Therefore, the Hassassins consider the Siasokak an impediment to the search for knowledge, and the Rama Task Force considers it a crime against humanity. 
The last time that the RTF attempted to arrest a gathering of the CSOCOC, they instead fled across the sphere, taking their research to the worst of the worst. Equinox, Submondo, the Black Labs, and more. To this day, the Rama Task Force considers arresting and eliminating the CSOCOC a top priority and doesn't mind crossing international borders to do so. More than once, Bakunin and Rama have come to blows over one or more so-called doctors. The Rama Task Force is deployed in less exciting ventures as well. They are a rapid response force, after all, so that means they are among the first units called upon in the event of terrorism, diplomatic incidents, commercial conflicts, environmental crises, regular old war. During those times, they might chase down terrorists, protect evacuating civilians, escort a commercial mission, protect exploration corps, contain an enemy offensive. If you want to hear more about those, especially the action in Paradiso, make sure to join my Patreon. This video is in fact a patron request, so uh, you want more of these? Uh, let me know. The most scandalous and most popular engagements are with slavers and human traffickers. Islam has its own complicated history with slavery. Although it was common in pre-Islamic Arabia, the Quran is filled with verses aimed at regulating, mitigating, and freeing enslaved persons. Many Muslims interpret the Quran as gradually phasing out slavery entirely. As such, the Rama Task Force is the first to volunteer whenever Bureau Athena learns of human trafficking. The RTF are a common sight and have a long history of fighting side by side with O12, especially when human rights are on the line. Controversially, the force also engages in operations of its own accord, violating international borders with some regularity while pursuing traffickers. The Sorosturma Bulumu, or Investigations Department, takes human bondage very, very seriously. Despite the rise in robotic labor, humans are still frequently used and abused, deprived of freedoms and forced to work. This is to say nothing of the Quantronic realm, where a person's consciousness might be forced to toil even while denied a body. RTF is renowned for its mercy and good conduct, but the gloves come off when freedom is involved. They shoot first, shoot fast, and take their time roughing up slavers and their associates. They can always seal any broken bones or punctured lungs later, after the humans have been freed from their unjust imprisonment. Many of those rescued go on to spread the word of the RTF as liberators. Some even join the Janissary Corps as the al Mustalaha, inspired by the heroic appearance of towering emancipators. When not called upon to perform those exciting activities, they keep their skills sharp with simulations and live fire drills against O12. They also engage in local deployments on Borak, especially in the area of Medina. They might defend Nasrallah or Nefsa after raids. They might support factory ships cruising on the Ibn Battuta. One common deployment is to strike bandits on the Salam Highway. The massive superhighway stretches from the smaller settlement of al mashia all the way to the megalopolis of Medina. al mashia is a lovely place, home to heavily patrolled docksides and bays and seen as an iconic destination for any tourist. But leave the city and things get dicey. The Salm Highway is the longest single stretch of unbroken road in the human sphere, an entirely straight line for hundreds of kilometers. It's perfectly safe and well lit at night, unless you're driving a cargo truck. Within the last few years, bikers and gangers have been forced from their usual territory by first Kasim Beg and then the leadership of the Nazarova sisters. Many made their way to the harsh Taba Desert, where they soon began preying on the massive mega trucks of silk and supplies that cross the highway. The monstruckers that drive these automated trucks are the first line of defense, and the Rama Task Force is the second. These operations are the hyena hunts, constant deployments against marauders, raiders, and sometimes even corporate-sponsored attacks on massive monstrucks. The RTF travels with the 5th Desert Combat Wing, an airborne assault group mounted in Rock-class dropships. The Rook, or Rook, uh, it's a medium transport, and it generally carries 12 to 17 troops in full battle gear. To service these aircraft and troops requires an efficient logistics network and a strong home base. It is known as the Watchtower. Locally, it is Al Murakab. This facility is designed with Hak Islamic balance and mastery of the terrain. It's not far from Medina, located on Kalyafto, the top of the cliff. Surely, some in Medina are nervous knowing that a military base is within the striking distance of the haphazard houses and dirt roads of the suburbs. But for others, it's a thing of beauty and pride, a symbol not of militarism, but of commitment. The watchtower sits both atop and within the cliffs on the Al Hazan Sea. Topside is the colossal communications tower that gives Al Murakab its name. It is a huge dome that rises from the edge of the cliff, providing a secondary uplink to the Eye of Allah orbital network. They say that whenever any pilgrim in the human sphere cries out for help, 
the Watchtower hears, and the Rama Task Force is not far. The comms watchtower is also critical, as Al Murakab has its own astroport. Topside is a dense network of launching pits, runways, hangars, control towers, and training centers. You can always see MSMC dropships taking off and setting down, that is, maximum speed, minimum comfort. These dropships are always camouflaged and often hooked to civilian freighters, a convenient way to perform covert ops where the Hajib has no authority. The majority of Al Murakab is underground, deep within the cliffs. Underground runways open across the edges of the cliff, allowing rapid access for fixed-wing aircraft. Most light and medium aircraft use these runways if they have Rama Task Force troops within. Civilian traffic also uses the Astroport. Most of it is shuttles that connect with Gelismek. That's the station at the top of Funduk's space elevator, or Shaea Base, which is the orbital shipyard where troops board larger spacecraft. Past the runways are the halls of the base. Here, far from the prying eyes of the public, are the Super Soldier programs. Soldiers frequently move between the base and Medina. It is a high-security space. The secrets of the Super Soldier programs, as well as the overall security of all the Al-Madinat Caliphate, rest within their hands. The Caliphate has put considerable funds into the Rama Task Force, and sabotage would be a serious blow. This is to say nothing of the copious amounts of intelligence held within the Watchtower's uplinks or the Astroport. This, combined with the heavy amounts of traffic through the area, means that a covert strike force might just be able to make an incursion, with a lot of planning and even more luck. If some other power were to attempt such an act, it would probably never be publicly disclosed. They might not even survive the attempt. It's not just technicians and garrisons and super soldiers at Murakab, because you gotta deal with the troops. The most common line infantry of all Hak Islamite operations are the Ghulam. They have specialized subunits within the Ghulam Corps. That is, Najarun engineers, Nafatun fire throwers, and Jayadan veterans. The Rama Task Force, being closely aligned with the Sword of Allah, makes copious use of these subunits in all of its deployments. All the super soldier programs show off their results within the ranks of the task force, and they train together to allow for some degree of flexibility despite their differing purposes. For example, Kawarij have Mantella poison augmentations, making them secrete a powerful neurotoxicant. They are trained to not high-five the Mukhtar, although the Nahab sometimes go for the high-five anyway. Despite their ability to kill, the RTF is also a paramedical response unit. There is a reason that all those super soldiers have doctor training. Like most military doctors, they have an Akbar kit, specialized tools that are only given once they take their vow. Even after discharge, Hak Islamite military doctors receive updates to their personal tools free of charge as a sign of their dedication. And they are dedicated. The ability to rescue on a moment's notice is critical, hence the appearance of Hakim. They are search and rescue units, airborne doctors and first responders that go where an ambulance cannot. However, the most publicly known part of the force is the 3rd Janissary Corps. This consists of both mainline Janissaries and also Hortlock Janissaries. Hortlock represent the Investigations Department of the Janissary Corps, and they are trained in part by Hassassins to better move in criminal circles. They also recruit mercenaries. The personalities are just sorta there. They met Carmen Johns, who's just an absolute demon, while deployed in Tartary on Ariadna with anti-slavery operations. They work with Fiddler because she's really cool, and she's worked with them before, and she likes a paycheck. Fiddler has existing ties to Hak Islam for lots of reasons. And they have Wild Bill. J.B. Hickok actually got his big break while working for Hak Islamite mining companies, so he's always had a certain affection for working with Hak Islam, especially the Janissaries. Rounding out their mercenary forces are the Monstruckers. The massive land trains often need help from the RTF to protect local shipments, and the tenacity of the Monstruckers has made them an appealing source of mercenary engineers. These troops are complemented by the talented Murabids Tuareg, named for the North African tribesmen. They keep their traditions alive as expert trackers and top-notch infiltrators, able to move through any terrain unseen until needed. For heavy support, they call on the al Fasid. They might be less honorable, but they provide overwhelming firepower, so, you know, they're cool, they're big, you love a big boy. But there's something even cooler, something bigger, something heavier. The mighty tags of Hak Islam are on full display in the Rama Task Force. For any element to successfully coordinate with an armored unit is impressive. Reactionary forces like the Rama are characterized by light units and self-sufficient soldiers. Tags are faster to deploy and more convenient than a 21st century battle tank. They are still high maintenance. There are some very serious considerations to make. The support staff, the transport, the cargo capacity, the fuel, and so on. It's no small feat. 
However, the leader of the task force, General Khatev, is adamant that Ms. Margaret here is worth it. She spent years using both the old and new versions of the Guard on Paradiso during the Neo-Colonial Wars. During that conflict, she became obsessed with pairing tags with connected support remotes, an expensive proposition, but one that provided Quantronic and physical defenses. The guards of the 16th Battalion were the most decorated during that decade-long conflict, wherein they most famously entered into repeated battles with the Japanese Sectorial Army of Yu Jing. Although fearsome, the Oyoroi was never able to perform on the same level as the Magariba when attacking, and the Japanese defenses repeatedly lost to guard units when defending. The Magariba Guard is the main tag in the Hakislamite military. It's an older model. The very old Beetle design was replaced by the newer Scorpion frame. Both of them are unpopular among exports because adjusting to the non-human locomotion can be annoying. It also means that remote controlling a wingman, like a Rafik, is even more work. Ghosting in and controlling it while using a tag is tough. Or, if you have a separate pilot, or AI pilot, you have to worry about being stepped on or crushed by four dangerous legs. Still, it's a useful combo. Hakislam's tag development is still ongoing. For example, look at the new Shakush unit. In an effort to design infiltration support units, the MAA requested something smaller that could be fit in a shipping crate, a container, or a dropship. It started with the Gangtea Corporation, a Yujingyu company that built heavy industrial tags. It was better to outsource, as Yujing has more experience with humanoid models. From there, it was refined into the LAT-2 Tokmak, or Hammer and Mallet, appropriate for an industrial tag and the Hammer and Anvil philosophy. 50 units were requested, and combat data from the LAT-2 was refined into the LAT-3 Matraka, hammer and mallet in Arabic instead of Turkish. The Hassasin Bahram provided feedback, and the Rama Task Force provided testing, and the resulting squadron was titled Shakush, or Hammer, fitting for the tag frame that they wield. There are five primary detachments, all of which might make for a fun modeling challenge for anyone thinking of getting into Hak Islam or the Rama Task Force. But the first thing that comes to my mind is terrain. If you're looking for scenery ideas, well, the Rama Task Force's usual modus operandi is to find a location and set up a base using fast prefab structures. All of it has shifting colors, though predominantly they specialize in rusty reds regardless of the terrain. Chameleon smart chemicals allow them to easily shift the colors if needed. If I were to make an RTF themed table, I'd either start with the Watchtower, a large military base with Hak Islamite elements, or I'd do a forward operation station. Either way, I'm thinking air vehicles and dropships. That would be a fun element and look very cool. At the absolute minimum, I'd start with a landing pad or guard outpost, giving it whatever colors I wanted, probably neutral reds and greens with some bright blue or yellow for the glow. For the individual detachments, there's the Al Murakab Security Detachment. Nothing fancy here, they provide local security for the Watchtower. A prized position to be sure, especially since the Watchtower is such a tempting target for espionage. Next up, there's the 5th Desert Combat Wing. They're the air power, and the troops mounted in the air power, great for rapid response actions, especially throughout Medina. If I were painting them up, I'd definitely follow the lovely Hyenas Hunt pattern. That means camouflaged armor mixed with the usual black-gray for metallics. Camouflage is hard at this scale, but I assure you, it can be a lot of fun. Just don't make it too effective. Vibrant and somewhat unrealistic camouflage is preferable. The better your camo, the better it is at actually disguising the miniature. The Malak Armama detachment is the task force for the Angel of Mercy. This means humanitarian missions first and foremost, though of course that doesn't preclude a little violence. They often wear the Kansli armor pattern, which is used for diplomatic security staff. The most notable unit with the Kansli armor pattern were the DSS units in Japanese territory during the uprising. Some Yakuza, supported by the nascent secessionist forces, thought they'd take a Hak Islamite embassy hostage. None of them survived, which tells you a lot about how seriously the Al Rama detachment takes itself. The Rama Aliadl is the Spear of Justice unit, and they're dedicated to dismantling human trafficking networks across the sphere. Many of them wear the Sword of Justice pattern, especially after Operation Saif Aliadl. The Investigation Department of the Janissary Corps learned of a pretty massive cube in human trafficking ring, ranging from the space elevators in Africa all the way to Mars. This was a joint mission done in tandem with the Imperial Service and Shock Army of Acontecimento. The majority of the fighting off-world was handled by the Janissaries, and they used an appropriate red and orange pattern for fighting on the half-terraformed Martian surface. Lastly, the Razia Detachment, named after the Sultanate of Delhi, represents the most distant unit. They're based out of Human Edge, and they were founded in the aftermath of Operation Red Veil. Fearful of further retaliation from Yu Jing or Pharma Corps, 
The Razia detachment is used for commercial missions and anti-corporate warfare across the sphere, although rarely on Borak. So if you're thinking of getting into Rama Task Force, uh, this isn't a tactics video, but I can tell you what to get and where to start. Get the Hak Islam action pack, or anything that looks like it. You want Gulam for sure. You could also get the Black Wind box if you don't mind proxying everything, like treating the Delami as Gulam. Grab Carmen Johns. She's really good and provides both close combat and smoke cover. Sadly, you can only use her on Rama Task Force and some Ariadna sectorials. You'll probably also want the Remotes pack, so anything that looks like this is what you want. After that, it's up to you. Most of what you got in that box is good for proxy. If you're looking for other really good units, the Mukhtar here is great as a hacker or for an observer. Ugh, so good. The Namur is also really fearsome, and she's really good, although she is really expensive. And the Jaidan box is really nice. I'm tired. I am so tired. I got more videos coming out, though. Uh, this one was a lot of work, as always, because there's a lot of information. It makes me shudder thinking about someday covering a faction people actually play. But uh, I'll do it especially if you pay me. And if you haven't subscribed, you should, because I got some actually completely unique stuff, especially about the upcoming books. Uh, so if you want some totally unique stuff about uh, Downfall, I'm your man, and I think you'll like it. Anyway, uh, give me subs or whatever. It makes me warm emotionally and uh, literally concerningly. Goodbye. Thank you.